I'm so excited. This is my favorite time of the year. It's the time when members of the Killers come on the podcast to talk about an amazing <laughs> new album. We've got we've got two years streak going, two previous right. appearances before that. Let's keep it up. Um, I'm so happy to be joined once again by Brandon Flowers and Ronnie Venucci. Thanks, guys, for being here. Thanks for having us. So a year ago, Brandon and I, we were talking about Imploding the Mirage, an album that I absolutely adore and was so, so excited about because I felt like it um, sort of just underlined and reminded me and the world what a killer's record could be. And what's so exciting about having you guys back this year is that just 12 short months, actually, no, they were very long months for Planet Earth. (laughs) Uh, Later, we have another album, Pressure Machine, which is thrilling in an entirely different way, because I think it's showing us all the different things a killer's album uh, could be. How quickly did the making of the records blur into one another? Because Brandon, I remember when we spoke last year, you were saying you already had some stuff going, you were already back at work. Was it as quickly as it seemed? Yeah, I, I, we had already begun before Imploding the Mirage was released. We were already going on. Pre- we had already made a trip to a studio in, in Northern California. It was everybody's first trip after lockdown um, had, had kind of started. What was that town, Ronnie? Katati, in Prairie Sun Recording Studio. And it was still, we still, it was still, uh, nobody had told us that we needed to wear masks yet. You remember, we still weren't, weren't, comp- weren't wearing masks yet. But we were scared to death. I think Sean Everett, was, <laughs> Sean Everett might have been wearing a, a sort of headgear. But that could have just been fashion at that point, right? It was still early. Yeah. Very, very likely. So it wasn't necessarily, I guess part of the narrative I was curious about unpacking was this idea that you made this, you know, album that was so ready to be played in arenas and stadiums and then found out you weren't going to be able to be in arenas and stadiums for the foreseeable future and pivoted, you know, and took advantage of the opportunity. But that might be a little bit faulty, right? Because it sounds like you were just, you had something going and you wanted to just get it down before a tour might happen. It was looking pretty ominous. Yeah, at that point, I think we knew that the the sky had fallen, and 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 we were sort of um, yeah, that was smacked at. That it would have been June or July, end of July. Oh, okay. So yeah, we, knew. It, we, we were we knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it it wasn't just Sean Everett. Um, do you no. do you think of the records as relational to each other? I mean, I, I if I was still wearing my my rock critic hat, which was a very ill-fitting hat, and I'm glad you guys aren't looking at it on Zoom, but I would say something like, you know, you can't implode without applying pressure, but I, oh. I feel, sorry, oh. you know, we, we can edit that. Um, <laughs> but do you think of them as relational? Do you think of them as records that needed to come out one after the other or in, in any ways in a dialogue with one another? No, the two records before were were companions. And we had never really done that before. So wonderful, wonderful, and imploding the mirage are, are, are sort of companions. Hmm. And so this is a total departure from all of that. And you know, it's in another world. And we, it, it's not. It, it's usually people say, "Well, like, we couldn't have made this without the without you know the previous record." Right. But our, I mean, sadly, the story for this is we couldn't have made this without the pandemic. It allowed us to to go into uh, this uncharted territory for us. Was there one particular song or idea that sparked the creativity that went into this, or, or or do you really credit it more to that that feeling that we're kind of talking about or talking around of like being forced to break out of that boom and bust cycle that you guys have become accustomed to of make the record, do the world tour, time off, do it again. There's this like there's this internal dialogue that I was starting to have. It was like you know feeling a little bit frustrated with that cycle because it, 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 on one hand you're so grateful that you're in this position to be able to go on these world tours and and play arenas and stadiums and 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 there's a lot of people that rely on 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 our machine that we've created to you know for for their livelihoods and and then on the other hand you have this you know this these other artistic muscles that you want to flex and these other uh, creative outlets that you want to look into. And you're wondering, you know, when there's going to be time for that. And so it, it, it allowed for that. Was there, uh, I mean, I, I guess I, re- I read an article or uh, what interview you guys did in the last few weeks. And I, and I wonder if this is accurate or not, but 
the the implication was that Brandon, you came in prepared with more lyrics and points of view and stories and characters than perhaps in other recording sessions where you've been more inspired by the music or it's been the last thing added. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, usually I am reacting to what the band is doing in the room. That's you know that's an ideal situation for for us when 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 they're firing and I'm able to respond. Uh, and this was very different. Uh, it was it was almost like how will you respond to this this place that we're trying to to bring people into? And I feel like that's something really cool happened with that. And people were forced to play differently and and show restraint and and we got some some really different sides to us. Ronnie, what, how does that play out for you as 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 a musician in the band? Are there ever moments of high stress or pressure where you have something really beautiful that you're excited about and you're looking at Brandon tapping on your watch being like, where are we going with this? I think you stumble into to little happy accidents. And, if, you know, of course, sometimes it takes a while to get there. Like he was saying, usually it's it's everybody sort of dishing out ingredients for 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 the you know, master recipe, I guess. And, um, and this way it was totally flopped. It was like, here, here's the focus here. Here's what, what I'm singing about. This is the feeling. Now put it, let's put it to music. Let's figure out how, how it rides with the lyric, which is actually, uh, like he was saying, a really fun process and, and maybe something we'll, we'll, we'll start to employ in the future. It's good. I love, I love the challenge of, of it's you sort of like, you know, a session musician or, or you know, more so like more like an actor, even, you know, where you, you're sort of given a part to play and you just, you try it out. It was a lot of fun. We, we ended up going to the, the other sort of byproduct of this, this fun exercise is that we ended up with different versions of songs. So some, some songs we have four or five different versions of these things and all of them good, but they all have to sort of fit the collection of the record. Can you name one of the songs in particular that could have gone in multiple directions? Well, so we have the last song of the record is called the getting by. And we actually have a, a very, you know, suitable for, you know, live playing for you know, radio play or more what you, what you call a, a killer style, I guess that we, you know, we're working on and abandoned for a more uh, simplistic approach. But we have that one. We have like d- different versions of West Hills, which are really compelling. It's all, you know, it's all, it's, it's all there. Um, and it was uh, gut wrenching, but also a little fun to sort of kill your darlings in that way. We have all these, you have a spectrum of, of, of songs to kind of choose from to lay a complexion down on the record. And choosing that was sometimes hard, but ultimately fun. I guess I'm, one of the things that I find most compelling about the record is um, for a band who, you know, one of your 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 best known and loved songs is is when you were young. This record has a very different perspective on youth, you know, from a different point of view. And I wondered for Brandon, just in terms of reconnecting with, you know, characters or archetypes or even real people that you remembered from your youth what that was like to look back on from this vantage point, having gone out into the world and toured and lived different places and now living back in Utah as you are. Yeah, it was, it was, it's, it's, you know, cliche of it being cathartic and things like that. It really can be, and you can really kind of watch yourself in, in real time, work through a situation with a song and see how you come out on the other side of the song and how much you've grown. So like I, I say, I could not have written these songs 20 years ago. I just didn't have the life experience and, and the empathy. And so it's like, it's was really interesting for me to go back and look at people and choices that they made that to me may have been shocking when I was a teenager and, and experience them now having lived more life and, and having more compassion and, and, and it's, it was, yeah, it was a great experience for me. I love that you said that. I, I, have, I specifically have a question about just loving, honestly, just breaking into a goofy grin by the time I got to the title track, which I think is just such a beautiful song. And I'm listening to it, to it loving it as a song and also thinking they couldn't have written this song 20 years ago. And I love that. I love the the development and the the craft, but also that it has kind of a, it synthesizes a lot of what I love about the band's songwriting um, in a very 
what feels like an effortless way. There's there's a confidence to it. There's style and swagger, but there's also song craft and skill and humor and space. I, I don't even know how to really describe that um, again because I've hung up my rock critic hat. But there's there's something, Brandon, the way that you deliver the lyrics where you let the song breathe in between them as you're telling the story. And I just feel like that is, there's a, there's a confidence to it that is exciting, both as a fan of the song itself, but also as a fan of the band for a number of years. Oh, thanks. You yeah, know, it's, um, it's, you know, we're starting just, just like it took, it took me a long time to, to settle into being a, a front man and, and feeling like I belonged on stage. And I think it's taken just as long or longer for me to settle into the, the idea that I can, you know, tackle these, these kind of subjects and, and that I'm worthy of being a writer, I guess. There's a, a song in particular, another one that I wanted to highlight, which I just think, you know, goes on the greatest hits album, as far as I'm concerned, which is Sleepwalker. Um, and one of the reasons that I love it is because it, it, I find it really transporting, not just in the stories you're telling and the lyrics, which are, I think, among the best you've written, but sonically, it is very, it is a very nostalgic song. I don't know if it's the it's if it's what sounds to me like a mandolin, but there's a to me it's an REM influenced song that celebrates you know the band that I loved the most in the '90s. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how that song came together as a marriage between such a well articulated vibe in the lyrics and uh, the music that you guys built around it. That one, it, it, there definitely is an REM influence. That was one of the bands that that kept coming up. There was you know when we talked about this. I always associate '90s music with, you know, the heavy hitters were kind of REM and Radiohead, Smashing Pumpkins, and all that. And there's always a little bit of a nostalgia and a melancholy uh, haze, you know, that I associate with those guys. But it started with with some lines, that song, and that one was actually worked on in, in Katati, and and Born There, and yeah, it's it's the it's the one song that has a tie to the last to the last record. Um, do you remember Ronnie when it started, it started, you know, we were just me, you and Rado. Yeah. I think we were just, uh, messing around with like a, a four chord, uh, thing chords on the bass. I remember we were just in that room. It feels like a million years ago. Um, <laughs> how did yeah. you, when you say it's connected to the last album, but it's the only one, how do you mean? It's, it's about this person who is, who is in a dark place and in, in the depths of depression. And I had, I had moved to, um, to, to Utah a couple of years before that. And I was experiencing seasons again. So I was, you know, in Vegas, we just don't get that, you know, that, ex, that, that true excitement and, and the glow of, of, uh, of autumn or, or, or you don't really get to see much, much life come back in the spring. And I was witnessing that again and having these senses and, and, and I was able to use those as symbolism for this person become, you know, becoming herself again. And, and it was, um, it was just the, the one thing that was, I think, tied to that sort of resilience and, and um, triumph of the previous record. The, the REM thing, I'm just glad you guys are, were feeling that because um, I talk about this with my podcast host, Chris, co-host all the time, Chris, like, that was the most important band in my life. And I feel like a vacuum in space where they were. And I don't know what role they play in people's musical minds anymore. I, I feel like I don't hear, until I hear a beautiful song like Sleepwalker, I don't hear them in bands today the way I hope to. And I don't know why yeah. that is. Yeah, it's yeah. too bad. They were one of those bands for me too. Sometimes you hear Paul ba- Interpol. Sometimes you hear Paul Banks will will will, will become Michael Stipe in a song. <laughs> you could kind of hear that sometimes. That's definitely true. But that even that, like, there's just something. I don't know. Maybe it's because they were unique. But it's sort of hard to. It's hard to communicate to anyone. I think that they were briefly the biggest band in the world. Like that. That in retrospect seems insane. Not like natural. Like it felt at the time. I'm I'm waiting for bands to get to that point again where we have pop songs. And that kind of spirit, like REM had, I also felt like they were a band, you know, a real just band. Today's, you know, focus on modern music is so just, you know, uh, f- focused on on one person, you know, and dance moves and shit. We do it. We have mandolin, mandolin all over this record. It was a little tip of the hat to, to Peter. The other thing that, that that really moved me was, um, you know, a lot of 
protagonists and killers songs tend to be, I mean, and there's a song called this, tend to be runaways. You know, the people who are either escaping or feel empowered in that moment to escape from a situation that maybe is bringing them down or crushing them. And and what I found really moving was, and I think Brandon used this word, but, you know, the empathy towards people who didn't have that moment, who didn't hit the road, who who stayed. And in another life is, I think, to me, the other standout on the record for that reason, you know, because it is it's incredibly uh, observant of the things that matter to someone who maybe saw the fork in the road and didn't didn't take the turn and the dignity of that life regardless. Yeah, that's one, that one of the things that I came away with from the record was how much I still love it there. You know, it was when I was 16, I wanted to get out. You know, that was that was that was first and foremost. And now having moved back close to the town and and visiting it, and I still have a sister there, um, you just see things in a different light and you respect the people and the the hardworking people there and, and the way of life and the traditions. And, but yeah, but on, in another life, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's about someone that's, that has these questions that we all might have and that we, that we all might ask ourselves. And, and that's, yeah, there's a, typically a silver lining in, in a killer song and the, there's not really one in, in, in that one. Did you guys find yourselves fighting against some of your well-worn instincts in making the record? I ask that because I think that one of the reasons you guys are rightly celebrated is you are so good at making big songs, you know, of, of capturing that moment that is a universal experience of wanting to escape or feeling, you know, like the biggest, this is the biggest moment in your life or the romance of the world in a, in a small decision. Um, both lyrically and musically, you guys can, you guys seem to be able to get there. Did you find yourselves in the making of this record coming up to that point where a song could blast into hyperspace like the Millennium Falcon and thinking, no, no, this isn't that song. This isn't that vibe. This isn't that record. That was precisely the, the, um, the story with, uh, that song I was telling you about the getting by. Right. That was, yeah, a sort of a, a split last minute decision that Brandon made. It's just, we were sort of okay with letting a song have the bombast, maybe have it be the last song, maybe get the chance at radio. And then at the very end, we, we sort of, you know, just kind of all agreed. It doesn't fit that way. It doesn't fit with the record this way so we need to try another approach with it even if the the song itself is does sort of lend itself to maybe uh, having a more uh, pop sound or or more rock sound or whatever yeah but you guys have in the car outside on there which feels like it snuck in with a fake id like (laughs) yeah kind of did that was uh, that was that one in particular was sort of the demo you're hearing the demo of us when we were writing it it, it sort of just, it had this identity out the gates and we couldn't beat it or we didn't want to beat it. We were, we sort of liked the way it ended up. I know you guys are, you know, citizens of the world and you see this as well as anyone, but it, you know, there's just been, I feel like it's been exacerbated in the last year and a half that, that as everyone's been sort of quarantined in their homes and everyone is siloed into their media bubbles and their, their, their points of view, this idea of being able to talk to other people in our country has felt like a, almost an, becoming an existential question. And I I don't want to phrase the question as if this is the responsibility of a rock band with their seventh record to, to do it. I, I guess I'm wondering how much of that outside chatter gets into your head, Brandon, when you are, you know, you are giving voice to people in parts of the country that some of your coastal fans or some of the fans who are waiting to see you guys in Central Park for that, you know, that unfortunately aborted show the yeah. other week, they've never been to this town and they might, judge some of the people in that town or right. reduce them to their, you know, to their voting records or their hats they're wearing or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Um, it was very observational and journalistic almost. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've seen some critiques of the record being that I didn't offer any kind of salve or, or cause and effect like uh, that, like that's ever been a, a, an artist's responsibility. <laughs> it's that's that uh, the album isn't called how to dismantle a pressure machine. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're right. not, there's, there isn't an, I don't know. We, we never said we were going to explain that to anybody. I'm offering you a glimpse of this place. And, and I, in, in my exercise of, you know, of this record, I, I feel like I be, understood these people better 
and felt more love for the and more tenderness for the place. So hopefully, uh, somebody that's never been there or you know in this part of the Southwest is able to think about you know or or get a little bit of a glimpse. Yeah, I hate I hate we're in this place where people look to art to answer questions that we're too afraid to ask. Like that's not actually what songwriting is supposed to do, you know, or or I don't know if you guys have seen this movie Stillwater that just came out where I'm like, I, I really liked it for many reasons, but one of which is it's a good faith exploration of someone that doesn't live in Manhattan. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, let's talk about people as people and then let's let them play out in be ways that are behaviorally true to them. And that's that's yeah. what a movie is. It's not uh yeah, it's not an instruction manual. That's right. I can't think of a great song that is though either. I, I, I it started to make me think about about songs that do explain it and give you a, a great answer as to why someone you know. I don't know. I don't remember. I haven't listened to it in a while. Is the last track on the U two record? Does it actually tell you how to dismantle the bomb? <laughs> I'm assuming that it's love. You know, it was, of course, it's love. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that is an answer for a lot of problems, <laughs> but, uh, but, but I just like, couldn't find anything to, to else to, to diss on the album. And they're just like, well, he doesn't tell these people how to fix their problems. I, I guess I, I, one of the things that I, I, you could probably tell from the way I keep coming back to it that I just love about this record. And, and again, getting the chance to talk to you about it is you guys just feel like you are hitting a creative stride that is really special, you know, with these two records back to back and just, you know, not just good vibes of the songs and of, of playing them, but of, you know, of possibility and, and exploration. And I think just as a music fan in general, one who, you know, already admitted to bemoaning the loss of REM in the culture, I just feel like we've lost role models for how to have a rock career, you know, for like how, for how to have a career over a period of time and what that, and what that might mean. I, I spoke to, your collaborator, Lindsey Buckingham, last week, and he's a musical hero of mine. And, you know, there's something that I just find very inspiring about the fact that he's like a painter who's been doing the same still life for 40 years. Like, he just hasn't cracked it yet, and he's still he's still working at it. And he's bringing the, you know, the new parts of himself to it, but he's still going at it. And I think one of the breakdowns of whatever has happened in the music industry is the loss of that kind of track, you know, or not just the track for the bands themselves, but for the fans to sort of go on the longer journey. Mm-hmm. You got an answer for that, Ronnie? I don't even know. I, that actually wasn't it's a question. A so it's, no, it's more of a comment. And then yeah. basically what I like to do, Brandon probably remembers this, I like to throw kindling on your fires and then I see what happens. <laughs> well, yeah. it's, we, when we started, that wasn't a, a problem. You know, it was, uh, there were t- a lot of, of bands that you could emulate and there were uh, roads that you could take and, mm-hmm. and you could, f- there were, you know, you could choose. It wasn't just one, you know, there were multiple and it does seem it's, it's 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 a scary time because if you aren't a great if you aren't great at Twitter, you know, like yeah. it's like what what it's it's scary. We 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 are still not great at at, at Twitter, and and thank heavens we got our foot in the door when it did. I see people like like Jason Isbell who's just like kills it on Twitter. <laughs> and it's like it's like such a blessing for for people like that. But what if you're just you're not great think, at Twitter. Or... But do you think it's making anyone happier? Do you think he's happier for being good at Twitter? I mean, this is just this is just me asking. Like, I don't know if that's. Uh, I think it, he must get some kind of satisfaction. Right. Uh, he's really good at it. He, he is good at it. <laughs> got... <laughs> but that wasn't that wasn't in the like that wasn't in the the rock and roll CV. Like, I don't think you were supposed to be pithy no. and, and politically astute in 240 characters from your cell phone. That wasn't part no. of it. Thank heavens. Well, I don't know that we would have made it. I don't know that we would have been great on Instagram or Twitter or TikTok. Um, and now you, ha- I mean, you have to consider these things. You have to consider how many people are shazamming your song. How many, you know, how, how it's, that's a scary thought. It's scary. We're so lucky, you know, as a band. I feel like some of the Samstown outfits would have been good on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're selling uh, yourself a little short. Yeah, well, if I just stood there, maybe and just didn't open my mouth. <laughs> um, so a year ago, um, when we talked, Brandon, you were talk, you know, we were you were projecting, and you were talking about how excited you were to bring some of the imploding the Mirage songs to concerts again. And you were sort of you were saying you were just you know they were having internal discussions about what song to begin with and what it would feel like to finally be out there again. And you even said maybe it should be Dying Breed. You weren't sure, but you could imagine yeah. that being feeling really good. And so. 
last week you guys or a, a little over a week ago you guys were at Terminal Five. Uh, yeah. You did it. You did Dying yeah. Breed. I watched the fan. I watched the cell phone videos, which is something we've yeah. done twenty years ago, and it felt like the right choice. Did you guys feel like it was the right choice to bring it back? Did it hit? Did it feel as good as you had hoped it would feel? For me, it did. Yeah. Yeah, that whole show felt like um, something almost otherworldly. You know, it, we hadn't played publicly for about two years, so that whole incident, that whole show, was just something else. It was emotional, as was Dying Breed. Yeah, I mean, it was. It seemed terrific. There's a moment, and again, I'm I'm reading into it, but and but someone had a very good cell phone angle of your face, Brandon, that I'm sure they then put on social media, but there's a moment early on when it's still the sort of the build up. You're in the second verse and the na na nas come in and it looked like you were so excited in that moment that you almost forgot that you were the singer of the band. That like <laughs> you were almost like, wait, I I'm enjoying this concert so much. It's up to me to make that sound. <laughs> it was surreal. You know, we'd been thinking about it. It's been 19 months since we played, uh, in a, you know, to, to, to people that were alive and in our face. And it was, it was incredible. Yeah, it was. Has it been frustrating then to have the sort of stop start reality that we're stuck in? Because, you know, you played that show and then the next day you were supposed to be at Central Park and, and you ended up, you know, beautifully playing acoustically for Gail King, who apparently is your biggest fan. I did not know that before I watched those videos. <laughs> yeah. And, and we were, you know, we just had a gig postponed in uh, Florida, Sand Jam. So it looks like more of that could be coming. And it's. It's wild. We're, you know, we're, I guess we're getting pretty used to it. Is the energy still flowing in, you know, in, in the creative direction? Like, okay, you've done this before you can pivot. Is album number nine already in the offing? Or album eight. I'm sorry. We, Maybe nine yeah, is we, too. Uh, we, uh, yeah, we were, yeah, we're, we have a couple of things cooking, but we're just, uh, we're just kind of, if all, if all, you know, goes well, we will be starting in New Zealand or Australia in, I think, late March or something. And if that's all going to happen, then then you, then I would I wouldn't hold your breath for album number eight. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, if that not, should, I, if that gets postponed, I mean, it could happen. You know, again, very quickly. In my defense, if it's a double album, then then my question was accurate. Um, okay. No, because because right near where I live in L.A., there are big posters up for your show here in August of 2022, which I kind of think is beautiful. I find that like very hopeful that if all things go right, we all know where we'll be on August 22nd, 2022 or whatever. And and certainty is very hard to come by these days. <laughs> well, you got to have your dreams. <laughs> exactly. Ronnie, where where are you with it just musically? Because I, I, I feel like it must be exciting to be in a band for as long as you've been in the band and know that this vehicle can is now load bearing enough that you can bring in the mandolin or um, the different notes and styles and fandoms that you've carried with you that maybe in the early days when, you know, people thought of the killers in one way, maybe it didn't feel as possible. Yeah. I think we've had, you know, we're all, we're all, we always threaten to, to, to go to, um, you know, another place musically and, and just have never had the, um, you know, a pandemic, I guess, uh, to throw us into this zone, um, to slow us down enough to, to, to have that kind of sensitivity, I guess. Um, I guess there's a silver lining there. Where was I musically with this record? I was, I was just trying to, um, do my best of supporting this feeling and the stories um, and the sentiment and the characters as best as I could. I mean, I, it's just, it's just such a subtle and effective record in so many ways. And I just, just, it's not just the mandolin on sleepwalker, but just Brandon, like the lines that you've come up with that, that, that cut through it. Like um, I can't remember the last time you asked me how I was, which I just feel like, Oh, I know. I said, I had those moments myself where it's just so sad and you're wondering where this, you know, you know, it's just things that you pick up on in your life. And, and I'm just lucky that, 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 that a lot of these things stuck with me and, 
and I was able to find an outlet for them. Um, you know, it's not tip again, it's just not something you typically hear on a killer's record. Um, those kind of sentiments and longings and, and that kind of sadness. And so it, it, even though it is really sad, a lot of the record, it, it was, there was something, a part of me that just felt um, really satisfied uh, to get it out. Yeah. I think it's just, I think it's just great. And I, you know, it, it, it's not often that people who are really good to use the film analogy, like making a blockbuster film can now make something with the graduate ending, you know, where they're just sitting oh, on the I, bus yeah. and it, and, and, and it sinks, it hits different, you know? And I think it really speaks to where you guys are musically and creatively that you, you had that at your fingertips. Thanks. Yeah, no, we're, we're really, we're really ha happy with it. I don't usually typically listen to killers records after they're done. And I, 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 I sit and listen to this thing still. There's something about the interstitials and the people. Yeah. Um, I think that does something for, that, that makes it even more listenable. And I, I really love it. I love the idea of someone hearing in the car outside, blaring <laughs> out of a car outside, and it's just you. <laughs> just <laughs> the driveway. <laughs> Nothing. I used to think the like the, the bar for, you know, the thing you can't do at a rock show is wear the band's t shirt to the show. But if the front man of the band is listening to the band, <laughs> that's. <laughs> That's next level, but also a, a sign of what you guys are up to. So anyway, I such a pleasure to talk to you guys again, as always. Thank you for coming on. Um, hey, Andy, come back anytime, man. Come back. I know that last time, Ronnie, you mostly want to talk about Ozark. And I intentionally left Chris out this time because. Oh, yeah, it's too yeah. bad. Stillwater was good, though. We could talk about Stillwater. I enjoyed that. One. That was good, right? Yeah. By the way, guys, no show on Monday because of Labor Day. So have a nice long weekend and we will talk to you next Thursday. Happy holiday, Baranskis.